my pleasure to be here today, and I'm going to be talking about the path through the great American health care scam to find health care that heals. This is a little bit about my night job. As you know, I wrote a novel, and I'm going to be talking about that during most of my lecture, but also a little bit about what some of the best evidence shows about what makes for health care that heals. Luke Skywalker, Harry Potter, and Dorothy, what do they have in common? I wish you were all on the line where you could speak up and say, heroes. They are all heroes. Today I'm going to talk about the kind of heroes we need in health care. You'll see, I think you know, we need them more in health care than perhaps in any other sector of society. Both patient heroes and healer, healing heroes, other types of healing heroes. So what do these healing heroes look like that we need most today? When you read my novel, The End of Healing, I think you'll discover they look a lot like you. You'll discover how much we need true patient heroes to stand up for true healing and how much we need true healers, people like my young Dr. Don Newman. Before diving into the story and into the dark underworld of the healthcare industry, let me give you a little background. As Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, and Walt Disney Productions have all discovered, all great stories involve a hero, hero's journey. And we need a great story in healthcare. These stories have several common characteristics, truly great stories. They all involve a journey into darkness, often the deepest darkness society has to offer. And not only does the hero journey into the outer darkness, but also into their own inner darkness in the best of these hero stories. And what's not often been talked about is the way in which most heroes' journeys are really searches for healing, both for the hero's broken world and for the hero, him or herself. So no one will debate that there's need for healing in healthcare. Both of physicians, nurses, and patients alike. As you know, there's a great darkness in modern healthcare. Our doctors know it. Over 50% are burned out. They say they aren't sure they can continue. And it's worst in the primary care disciplines. Greater than 25% of residents are clinically depressed and at risk of suicide. And physicians are at double the risk of suicide compared to the general population. So why? What's the root cause of this deep misery amongst those who arguably have some of the best jobs in America? It's because doctors know deep down that the system in which they work, their workplace, the system in which they're complicit every day of their working lives is horribly broken because every day they know they're living a lie. American hospitals where people put their greatest hope for healing, are among the most dangerous places for humans to go. And every day, more than a, than a 747 plane load full of people is killed by medical mistakes in these hospitals, these so-called halls of healing. Every year, over 250,000 people are killed by these preventable medical mistakes in hospitals, and yet we all still pretend that hospitals are the best places for healing. We rely on an outmoded hospital-based rescue care system that waits until things have gone horribly wrong before it springs into action. 
we spend $2.7 trillion a year on this broken system, now more than $25,000 a year for a family of four, and more than $50,000 a year for the average Medicare age family of two. And our spending is growing out of control, more than most families can afford. Worse yet, one-third of our health care spending is wasted on care that is harmful, unnecessary, or doesn't work. And our doctors and nurses know this truth in their hearts. But it's verifiable by groups like Thomson Reuters, who showed that over $700 billion a year in health care is clearly wasted, spent on so-called care that does more harm than good. Sir William Osler, the great John Hopkins physician, once said, medical care must be provided with the utmost efficiency. To do less is a disservice to those we treat and an injustice to those we might have treated. Is American health care a model of efficiency, of justice? No. You know it. American health care has become an unseemly scam and every day, our families, friends, and neighbors are suffering the consequences. This is the world in which my young protagonist in the end of healing, Dr. Don Newman, finds himself. So, when I decided to write a story to point the way out of the dark underworld of modern medicine, I could imagine no better model than the divine comedy of Dante Alighieri. Dante's story begins nel mezzo del cammino di nostra vita. Mi retrovai per una selva oscura che la dritta via era smarita. In the middle of the way of our life, I found myself in a dark wood where the straight way was lost. Similarly, Don's awakening happens in the middle of the dark night in the hospital when he's called to the bedside of a woman who has experienced a massive stroke without a chance of significant recovery, where he feels forced to put in a large IV that he is certain she would refuse if she could only speak. As he stabs her neck with the IV, the voice in his head whispers the oath he had taken at the beginning and again at the end of medical school. And at least I will do no harm. Bullshit. Harm is my business. How could any good ever come out of what I'm doing here to Sybil Bellamy? Then he's faced with a choice, like Dante Alighieri before him, like Neo is asked by Morpheus in The Matrix, a question like I'm asking you today, whether you will stand up against the status quo for something different, for something better. When Don meets his mentor, Dr. Gil Sampson, to learn about his Ivy League graduate program in health system science, Sampson tells him, our fellows are trained to become agents for health system change. They study how the health systems function and analyze the root problems in American medicine. I'm looking for a doctor who wants to take on the status quo, the doctor for whom making money is not the first concern, the doctor who wants the health care business focused on the patient instead of the paperwork, a doctor burning with desire to bring true healing to the American people. It's not easy for a young doctor to choose this path of change with greater than $200,000 in debt on average, and so many much more lucrative options working for the system as it is doing business as usual rather than working to make health care better. Dr. Sampson admits as much, telling Don that how lucky he would be to join his program. Plus, Dr. Sampson says, you'll get a degree in public health, the one degree which is guaranteed to lower your starting salary. Then Dr. Sampson asked Don the same question I'm asking you. Listen, you have a choice. 
You can go back to the wards, try to forget this little conversation, and work for the medical system as it is. Or you can follow me to the bottom of the rabbit hole. If you come to Florence College, all I can promise you is the truth. No salary guarantee. No fancy car. My program isn't easy, and only time will tell where it will lead you. But you will learn the truth about the healthcare industry, and you might find yourself in a position to help change things for the better. So the choice is yours. What are you going to do? Do we have the courage to face the truth as a country and individually? To take the hero's path with Don, to stand up and demand better care? If you do, let me give you a clue to where that path might lead. As Dr. Sampson says in the first of his health system science seminars to his young graduate students, if you want to understand the truth about American health care, follow the money. Follow the money. If you travel with Don on his hero's journey and follow the money, you will discover what many of our most profitable health care companies don't want you to know. As Dr. White, another one of Don's mentors, tells Don, payment has nothing to do with quality of care or results. So it's not whether you kill or cure, it's how you code the claim. In fact, hospitals make much more when they make mistakes. Doctors make more when they rush and do a shoddy job. And insurers make more when they deny needed care. So this is a diagram of Dante's Inferno. Using Dante's divine comedy as a guide, as a secret key that unlocks the hidden secrets of the healthcare business, Don Newman journeys through the underworld of the healthcare industry. He discovers that for every ethical misstep that Dante catalogs in his Inferno, there's a corollary mistake in modern medicine. Don discovers that Dante's Inferno provides a perfect ethical framework for un understanding the unjust misallocation of resources in the American healthcare system. Using Botticelli's magnificent drawings of the Inferno and what he learns from his study of epidemiology, biostat, and health economics in his Ivy League program, Don doodles a parallel drawing in the back of his journal. And this is his drawing. He discovers in his class and in his work that from the perspective of basic human val values, our allocation of health care resources is completely upside down. He discovers that where we spend the least dollars on primary and preventive care, we get the most in terms of lives saved. But where we spend the most dollars on hospital rescue care and hype care, we get little to nothing in terms of lives saved and a shocking number of lives lost. The world of health care is upside down. So like Don, we have to begin to ask whether the time for this outmoded system of so-called healing has come to an end. When we realize, as Don does, back in 2001, for the money spent on fraud and high profits in health care, Americans could hire 10 million teachers. What would do more good? Maintaining exorbitant profits for powerful health care companies or teaching our 70 million children how to improve their own health? It's time to take action to demand something better. As Don discovers, we can stand up and demand something better and get true high-value health care for ourselves and our families. But first, you have to know the truth. You have to walk along with Don or with patients who've experienced the harms that health care can cause. On that hero's path, to understand what we must require of our healers, and we have to hear the stories of people like us, patients, to discover what true healing looks like in the real world from the patient's perspective. Only then will we be able to demand and find true health care that heals. 
So what can we Americans do to address the perverse situation that has created this crisis of values? First, we must admit the problem isn't just about managing disease, but one of managing money. All that needs to be done to fix things is to move all the misspent money from hospital care and hype care, where it does mostly harm, to the primary and preventive care sector, where it can actually do some good. We have to flip our spending and our values upside down. This won't be easy, because every dollar wasted is some healthcare industry's ill-begotten profit. Old values die hard, especially when patients and providers have to realize, with their hearts and minds, where the true value in healthcare really is. Real health system transformation will not be easy. So what can we do to put primary care and prevention first? To begin, we must make health care accountable first. Every American needs to know how much they're spending on health care, what they're spending it for, and who's getting the money. At a minimum, every service ought to result in a bill that is easily understandable and makes clear who is getting paid for what, including administrative overhead. Second, we need to invest in new models of care. We know these models. We, we need to pay for primary care-based population health and prevention first. We must invest in the real infrastructure needed to provide effective primary care and population health. And patients can find ready partners in their efforts to strengthen primary and preventive care in neighborhood clinics throughout the country. Third, we have to work together to flip the entire system. Ultimately, to find high-value health care, we need to flip the system to emphasize prevention and chronic disease management in primary care and community settings rather than hospital-based rescue care. As Maureen Bisignano has so eloquently said, flipping health care means flipping the balance of care from the hospital to the community. Truly person-centered health care must consider and seek to understand the entire spectrum of social and economic factors that affect a person's health, not merely the narrow slice of how or why a patient presents at a hospital or clinic. What this ultimately means is replacing hospitals with clinics, replacing expensive emergency department care with home visits, and nursing homes with home care. To truly flip the system will, need, will mean radical improvements in access to primary and preventive care in every community. Neighborhoods will have primary care clinics within walking distance. Clinics will routine off, routinely offer expanded hours and home visits, as well as accessible electronic and phone communication. And every clinic will extend its connections into the community, offering ready access to mental health services, health coaches, diabetes education, and fitness and nutrition support. We can afford this. We have the money to do this. It's just being spent in all the wrong places. As Paul Grundy said, what patients want is that deep relationship with a healer. This is the foundation on which we need to build health care. As Michael Berry and Susan Edgman Levitin have argued, high value health care starts with asking our patients, what matters to you? Our health care system should be built around what informed patients value. It is incumbent on providers, policymakers, educators, regional health improvement collaboratives, and most importantly, patients themselves, to become informed about what health care that heals really is, so that we can find it for ourselves and our loved ones. And for that, I think you will find it helpful to read The End of Healing. Thank you very much.